Hey everyone, so my name is Amy June and this is Sean Dietrich from Canopy Studios and he is a full stack developer. He's an overall nice guy and he's one of the leads on the Doxel project. So today you're going to talk about Doxel. I'm going to talk right. about Doxel. Okay. So he's going to talk about Doxel. Thank you. Good morning everyone. So uh, as you can see, presentation today is on Doxel, more development, less ops. Uh, kind of expand upon what Amy June just said. I'm a technical lead. Well, first, my name is Sean Dietrich. I'm a technical lead at Canopy Studios. Uh, we're a fully distributed company across North America. And these are the different ways you can contact me through Drupal.org, Twitter, and other various social media. Um, I am a maintainer on the Doxel project, which we will get into further what that is specifically. Uh, I've been doing Drupal development specifically for the last 10 years. So, and then, fun fact, this is my first time at Drupal Corn Camp. So, uh, and actually my first time in Iowa. So, without driving through it. So, I will say I'm from California and it is a bit chilly this morning. <laughs> so, uh, just some quick notes. Uh, this is what we are going to be going over, basically what Doxel is, how to install it, uh, adding Doxel to a project, we'll quickly go over that. Um, ways you can extend Doxel, so Doxel itself is, is a piece of software and we allow you to extend it to make it better for your workflow. And then if we have some time, uh, we'll do some demo and then a QA. Uh, throughout the kind of slide, just hear me mention a few things um, related to these, unfortunately. We don't have the time, um, nor do we, uh, yeah, we just really don't have the time to go over them, so I'm not going to touch on them a, uh, a lot at this moment. Tomorrow morning uh, at 10.30, I'll be doing uh, Birds of a Feather, which I believe is 3.02 over here. So uh, if you have any more questions or you just want to learn a little bit more and kind of have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation, uh, I will be there. But so we won't be going over any Docker specific configurations um, or any CI related. Um, we do have some stuff with Doxel sandboxes, which uh, is kind of the whole thing with why we won't be talking about CI. Um, and then Bash, you know, specifically how to write it. Um, and then lastly, I do want to I do want to kind of mention that there are other competitors out there, um, and I do want to mention that there are other applications out there that do that are very similar. So. Lando, DDEV, Lagoon, we won't be comparing them. So uh, if you do have questions about those, uh, once again, come tomorrow and uh, we can kind of have further discussions. So let's talk about the history of development briefly. Um, originally, okay. Uh, originally, it started with bare metal. Um, basically, you had a machine that you did development on. And over time, this became harder for teams to manage, um, and lots of the time it became in inconsistent. And this led to this works for me syndrome. Boop. Then came virtual machines, uh, or VMs as some people like to call them, um, which was better. It was better than bare metal because we could transport them from machine to machine, and we, can, we didn't have to have these very overpriced servers to uh, do what we needed to accomplish. But it still had negative impacts. Um, each instance was different from each other uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, they required a lot of disk space. They still to this day, unfortunately, require a lot of disk space because you're loading a full operating system. And then the maintenance of them to move them, um, to make sure they're always updated, to make sure your team is always updated, is, is usually a hassle. Now, uh, in the day, this day and age, we most recently come to the concept of containers. Just like everything in its previous aspect, we want to be smaller, we want to be faster, we, wanna, we basically just want to start developing. We don't want to have to worry about setting up uh, a lot of uh, you know, our, our environments, we don't have to worry about configuring, and so, the idea of containers is that they are smaller, they're faster, um, definitely modular, and uh, the biggest thing is they are shareable. So I, along with most of the any other team I'm working with, can have the same setup, can have the same image, uh, the same environment we're working off of. 
This leads us into development operations, or as many of us know, DevOps. Um, so kind of segue into this, uh, usually when you have one of those three that we just mentioned, there's a person who knows a lot about how those are configured, and they're usually considered to be their DevOps, the sysadmin DevOps person. Well, now we get into to DevOps. Not every team can afford a DevOps person. Um, not everybody has the skill, um, and kind of messing with that becomes a big, uh, a big burden on some some organizations. So, what is DevOps? Well, Amazon, uh, AWS classifies it as DevOps is the combination of culture, philosophies, practices, and tools that increase an organization's ability to deliver applications and services at high velocity. There's some more of that, but the biggest thing uh, I wanted to underline is at a faster pace. And the reason why um, we'll be talking about that later on is because in this day and age, we, we need to be going faster as developers, not spending uh, tons of time setting up uh, environments for new developers who come on board, or if we're moving to projects, uh, spending the time for that. So whenever, um, kind of take a break for a second, one of the things uh, I always think of when someone says, oh, do you do DevOps? Um, or when I'm speaking to somebody and they say, yeah, you know, can you, can you do anything with you know, DevOps? And so I always think of this image, mainly because trying to explain to people what I do and what people actually think I do um, is really just a, it, it, it is classified as this. Um, trying to explain to people, yeah, I really just fix things that, to make them better sometimes, and people think I'm just have the magic touch because I'm able to make things work. So, speaking previously, we were talking about containers. One of the biggest uh, applications or engines used for containers is Docker. There are many others, uh, but Docker is the one primarily uh, that is the, lately the most popular. It's also one, one of the biggest ones we use uh, for Doxel specifically. Now, I'm sure we've seen similar images to this, and uh, to basically explain what Docker, how Docker compares to, say, virtual machines, um, in a VM, each application uh, not only includes the application or the site, uh, which could be tens of you know, tens of megabytes, but it's necessary binaries uh, and libraries are also included uh, in that entire operating system, uh, which eventually can weigh to be uh, tens of gigs. So I think the lowest I've ever been able to install an OS is roughly eight gigs, which if you are operating on 20 plus projects, that becomes uh, a horrible use of disk space. Now we go over to containers, and with containers, um, it's just your application, it's dependencies. So specifically, we only, uh, if we only need specific versions of uh, PHP or uh, Solar or uh, Image Magic or, or items like that, they can be uh, installed specifically on that uh, on that specific image, and we don't need that, anything extra that comes with a normal operating system. Usually. These, uh, the benefit of this is that they are quicker to start up just because they're smaller in size. And then uh, this usually results in them being smaller. They're smaller in size, so they're more efficient when transporting from uh, environment to environment. Now, I realize that many people either A, um, are looking at that and saying, okay, I'm, I'm not really understanding, so what's going on? Well, to kind of explain it a little bit better, Docker images are really, um, they're a quick way to install it and configure applications and make them, uh, make them basically the same across, mirrored across environments. Each Docker image is crafted to contain only the appropriate applications that are needed uh, for that specifically to work properly. And then when I tell people that, they tell me, what? 
So then, the easiest way I break it down is, why doctor? And usually I like to tell them, I ask them questions. Well, do you like installing new software from source? Do you like manually configuring software every time it's installed on your machine or on someone else, a new developer on the project's machine? Has anyone found that it's easy to install multiple versions of a piece of software, a, 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 an application, a library? Not only that, do they find that the developers on the project are using different versions? Different versions of PHP, different versions of Solar, different versions of Ruby, different versions of uh, MySQL. And so, and then lastly, if you're working on multiple projects, do you find it easy to have a template that you can start from? That you can move from your machine to another developer, and, and you'll see kind of over the, the progression of the slides is that is the theme. Um, being able to reproduce the same environment you're working on along with all of the developers who are with you on your team. And as I said, the environment templates. So then once people ask, once we talk to people about that, I ask them the biggest questions, uh, especially when I'm recommending Doxel to them, are you finding that you're duplicating your efforts? Are you finding that you're installing software? Maybe only once for a project. And you know, after that project is done, within a couple months, you no longer need that. So trying to uninstall and, and then basically getting rid of that application becomes a, a bit of a hassle. And then onboarding new developers. It can take hours. Um, you know, the first time that you're doing a project, <clears throat> it's, it's sort of most of the time encompassed into a project's timeline. It's encompassed into a, a, a project's budget. But then what about when you bring new developers on? So you need to bring on another two or three developers just so you can hit a deadline. Who, who ends up paying that for that? Is it the client that pays that? Is it the shop that pays for that? And that becomes a bit of an issue because especially if projects take 80 plus hours to set up sometimes, whose, whose budget is that coming out of? And so, and then lastly, is it too long? So this goes basically with the previous one, is, is it too long to set up a local environment? Does it take you, uh, does it take you hours to set this up? And you become frustrated to the point that you go insane because you're doing this and now you have to tell someone else how to do this and then someone else how to do this. And so it, it's not something that becomes repeatable and eventually over time, people make mistakes. We're human, it happens. So what's Doxel? Doxel is a tool used for managing development environments. It is Docker-based and it helps minimize in configuration of projects. So we have a specific uh, we have a configuration file that you include in the project and that basically tells how to set up, you know, what, what items you need to get that project set up and spin up. It's consistent. So it's consistent across Mac, Windows, and Linux, uh, mainly because we are using the Docker environment, which includes the Docker images, which uh, when you download new ones, they're all the same. And then some of its extra features is uh, it is Docker-based. Uh, we have a default AMP stack, which nine times out of 10, that will satisfy a project's needs. It's easy to install. There's a, I will show you in a few slides, but uh, there's a single line command that you can use to install without having anything installed at all, how to install Doxel. It will install Docker for you uh, and then configure everything as appropriate. Uh, I mentioned it's cross-platform, so Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, it's also across multiple flavors of Linux. So uh, mo most of the Ubuntu and the Debian's, uh, and as well as um, CentOS, um, it will be, it is covered under that. And then the biggest thing is it's extendable. So uh, while it has its great features out of the box, not everybody necessarily uses those or they have specific workflows that are necessary for, that, for their team. 
So as I mentioned, uh, Doxel, Doxel is easy to install. And when installing for Mac and Linux, you're really just going to use a single line on your terminal. And from start to finish, it takes care of downloading the necessary files. Uh, it takes care of installing uh, Docker for you. If you have Docker installed, it will already use that. So there's no need. Um, it's not going to download it again. But basically, the single line will have you up and running in roughly about five to 10 minutes. Um, some people I do know use Vagrant. They are using Vagrant for development. And we have found that there's a bit of an issue, uh, mainly because Doxel by default uses the user's directory. And uh, Vagrant uses specific folders to mount to each, each project. So uh, if you are using Vagrant, um, I would recommend reading uh, the blog post we wrote about how to get do basically how to get Docs installed with Vagrant you know, side by side. And then Windows specifically, um, we do require a, a Linux subsystem. So we use, um, by default, we've used one called Baboon, which is a Sigwin uh, fork. But there's also uh, additional ones where we, we have it working on the Ubuntu shell as well. So. All right, so Doxel with projects. How does this work? So when starting from, basically when starting from scratch, we have a fin project create, and what that will do is it will come up with a wizard, and the wizard will tell you, it will ask you what kind of project do you want to start. Do you want to do a Drupal 8, Drupal 7? Uh, do you want to do a WordPress? Do you want to do a backdrop? Um, there's at least, I think, 15 different options for you to start from. Um, but if you are using an existing project, you know, you're working on a project and you're interested about trying out Doxel, um, the biggest thing is making sure you just have the Doxel directory. Just an empty directory in there is all we need to start the project. And then once you have that in there, running fin start, uh, we'll get that going. We do have, as I mentioned, um, uh, a Drupal 8, we have a Drupal 7, we have a Drupal 8 Composer version. So as we're starting to progress towards using Composer with Drupal, uh, we've started to build that in and, and put that whole workflow. And so we do have a uh, link to that repository if you are interested to see what does that look like and how is that configured. Um, additionally, we have other boilerplates to start from, and those are the ones that really show up with the FIM project create. So, take a step back. Uh, we've seen where Doxel can be used. Um, we have a basic understanding, um, I hope, of Docker. And the question always becomes, do we really need Doxel? Doxel helps with many things, but it's an extra added layer. And the question is, do we really need it? Um, to fully understand why, uh, why developers would uh, like to use Doxel, we do a comparison. So when running commands with just Docker, um, and I'm actually using Docker Compose, which is a separate add-on, uh, which actually simplifies this a little bit more. But when using with Docker directly, uh, these are things, uh, so specifically I use Docker for Drupal just as a baseline, and these were the uh, commands that to run things like adjust status or a Drupal list or a composer list, uh, as well as things like executing uh, a command in a specific container. So specifically, we want to execute something in our PHP container. And running things uh, from, the, from the database layer. And then how would we get those specific databases in or out? So as we can see, the commands are quite lengthy. Um, they uh, do have room for error. And then we look at some of the similar commands with Doxel that we have set up. Um, we basically preface uh, all of our commands with fin. That is the, the command that runs Doxel specifically. And so, as we saw before, we have fin just status, fin Drupal list. So we're not adding on that extra uh, the, the extra configuration, the extra 
arguments that run the risk of uh, someone mistyping them or someone ac accidentally forgetting one. And as we can see, we also have uh, other commands for executing uh, commands within what we call our CLI container. It's also the, our, considered our PHP container. And then uh, going to the MySQL shell, as well as exporting a database and then looking at logs. So I mentioned that uh, Doxel comes with a lot out of the box. It comes with much configuration, much of it's automated uh, and set up to, to do what a basic developer needs to do. Well, there becomes times when we're doing extra things. We're doing things that even on the Doxel project we don't think of people doing. Um, biggest example would be headless Drupal. For the longest time, that was not something uh, that seemed really popular, but now more and more people are starting to get into that. So the biggest thing we wanted to make sure of is that you could extend Doxel to fit your specific needs. Now, by default, Doxel comes with all of these services built in. So we have a, a service for Memcache, um, we have a service for uh, Blackfire, Solar, um, Xdebugs uh, configured. I mean, who, who loves configuring Xdebug? So, uh, and then obviously we have PHP and BHAT and all these wonderful uh, other things, Varnish. But um, it becomes, well, I, what, you're, what you have isn't what I need or you don't have this specific version. Well, the greatest thing is because we work off of Docker Compose files, anything that's on Docker Hub is, is fair game. So in Drupal, as we always say, there's a module for that. Docker Hub, there's usually an image for that. Um, and if you ever navigate to Docker Hub, you can see that there are different images, different versions of different applications. So an image is really, as I said before, um, it's a compiled it's a compiled version of only the applications that you need to get a specific um, a specific project running. And so extending Doxel, uh, we have many different ways that you could do it. Um, the biggest is we set up uh, we allow you to set up your own commands. So commands are a way to speed up your workflow, um, to be able to uh, specifically run uh, with a, uh, set up a clear cache or a cache rebuild or a, um, what are others, uh, to open up a database in your MySQL client. Uh, that seems to be the most popular one for us is uh, some of our developers use SQL Pro and to be able to copy and paste all of those connections can take you know, a minute, and while that doesn't seem long, um, you know, that's just at, at a time to someone's day just by simply typing in a few things and copying and pasting. So we've uh, found a way that we can get those connection details to go into SQL Pro and open it for us quickly in, say, five seconds as opposed to, I don't know, maybe the 30 plus seconds it took for us to copy and paste. Uh, these commands are also shareable. So the commands can be included in a project and the project can then be that those commands can be stored in a repository. That repository then goes to other developers and those developers can have access to those commands. Uh, which also means that they're reusable. So we can, uh, we can take those commands and we can find that we're using them not only on um, project A but on project B or C or D. Uh, we're finding that we're doing the same thing. So we can include them as part of that project. Uh, and then we can target specific environments. So a few slides ago, we saw how to run Docker Compose, and you specified what container you wanted to execute commands into. Uh, we have a similar concept where we, uh, when you have commands, you want to run them on your database, uh, your database container. You want to run them on uh, your web container. And so the idea behind Docker is that you have different services separated into their own application or their own containers so that A, 
Uh, it's more of a multi-service. Um, it's a service-based architecture. Uh, so, as I was saying, you can execute commands in specific environments. Um, some ways, other ways of extending is, for instance, in Apache, uh, which is what we use by default, uh, everybody uses really the stage file proxy module, which can be cumbersome, it can be, uh, it can have horrible performance sometimes, especially if you forget to uninstall it by the time it goes up to production. So, as a way to mitigate those issues, uh, we found a way that we can proxy, uh, we can go to a specific source and, and look for those, those images, those files. That way we're not forced to download the full files database, the full files folder, and, and we can just use the canonical source of where those, those items are. Uh, other ways is sometimes, P, sometimes uh, PHP requires you to increase memory. Um, you know, we I think we have a 512 by default, but sometimes it requires you know, maybe a gig, two gigs. Um, if sometimes if you use Composer, you're finding that Composer uh, maybe requires a lot more memory, um, which seems to be a, a pretty big gripe. Uh, additional things. Uh, we can inject database credentials. So those of us who might use uh, Pantheon know that they inject their database credentials into, uh, into the project so that, um, so that you don't have to have those in a settings file. Well, we can do something very similar where we're also injecting them so that uh, you know, we're not forced to do a setup every single time. And then, as I mentioned, we can also do MySQL, uh, we're, we'll enable slow query logging or modify the MySQL to be whatever extra features we need it to be. So commands, uh, I want to expand upon this just a little bit more because um, I don't think that I don't think that previously you know the four little bullets that I said kind of do justice of what it can do. Um, so specifically. Uh, specifically, commands are scriptable actions that help simplify uh, a project or a developer's workflow. Example would be that if I was using Gulp on a project and I knew uh, I didn't have nor did I want to have my developer install Gulp all the time on their machine and, and have issues with that, we would install it in the container. Well. When we run it in the container, the problem is how do we execute that? So we create what basically is a gold wrapper, and we're running, uh, we're running, we're changing into the directory where our theme is, and then we're running the gold command with whatever extra arguments we want to include with it. And so what this allows me to do is stay on my machine and not have to have gold installed, not have to worry about what version of npm, um, not have to worry about me having one version of Node versus mo another developer on the project having a different version, and therefore running into configurations, uh, configuration issues, along with um, you know some people run on Mac, some people run on Windows, and those configuration lock files can sometimes uh, cause issues between OSs. So we uh, we install Gulp into the container, and at that point, how do we run it? And so, uh, specifically, we target a container. So we'll put exec target what the container name is. Um, we do some comments, basically, just to say what the command does so that anybody who comes in knows what it does. Um, we change, so when we have these in our, in our commands, we'll go into that container, and then we'll execute everything that's part of that. So we'll go, well, we will change into the site theme, uh, the site theme theme, and then we'll run Gulp, which is a part of the project. It's been configured. And from that point, uh, the developer no longer has to worry about installing Gulp, has to, doesn't have to, does not have to worry about installing NPM. Um, it doesn't have to worry about what versions of, uh, of a file he might be, or a package he might be using, because that's all part of the project. 
to do a little bit more of an in-depth uh, command. Specifically, I found uh, over time that I spent a lot of time, um, when I worked on features, I spent a lot of time going out, grabbing a new database, bringing the database down, installing the database, and then uh, running things like Drush CC, uh, Drush CR, uh, to do a capture build. And I found over time that that ended up taking a lot of my workflow. The, you know, within a day, I would easily spend a uh, combined of an hour to two hours trying to knock out different features. And specifically, the way we work is we do a feature, uh, and that's its own branch, and we get that approved. But on that, we're also simultaneously working on other features as well. So obviously, every time you're working on a feature, you need to make sure you have a reset of a database somewhere. Well, I found that I was constantly doing that. So I decided that I wanted to pull a new database um, roughly every hour, anytime I was working on something. Um, we can modify this. So I found that an hour was enough time because the client was putting in data. But as the client was doing that, I could still, I, I felt like an hour was enough time. So uh, all I did was set up, um, so within my CLI container, just using Josh, uh, specified environment. So we have an alias file. Um, and all of this should be included in that bit.ly link. But uh, we had an alias set up so that uh, we knew what environment specifically we were pulling from. We went into the specific uh, directory where our project was. And we checked to see how, how old the database file was. At that point, we said, OK, hey, this file's older than an hour. Uh, it could have been older than, you know, it could be two or three hours, possibly even a week old. Uh, at that point, who knows? So we we looked at and see what the data on it was. And then we decided to go to the remote, uh, so the production or sometimes the staging sites, and pull a new database down. Now, doing this manually all the time, as I said, took up took up an enormous amount of time. Not only that, it was when something was done, I had to make sure I kept attention to it and then jump onto another thing. And so over time, I just felt like there was a lot of time being wasted here. And why can't we just automate this? So, uh, and then at this point, we truncate and then we in store, we import the new database. Now, that is very lengthy and many developers might not have the same workflow. Um, that is, uh, we've actually found that that works pretty well for some people, mainly because they are, uh, it just helps them start from a fresh state of wherever the client is at that moment. Additionally, uh, on top of commands, we have something called add-ons. Uh, add-ons are very similar to commands, but add-ons are packages. So specifically, um, they are a set of commands and configuration uh, for a specific package or feature within uh, Doxel. So we have things like admin or uh, database management. We have things like, as I mentioned, SQL Pro. So uh, we've launched that. Uh, we also have configuration for Solar by default. Um, and even items such as uh, Drush ULI. You know, that, we found that, that sometimes that could possibly take, uh, even if you're just typing fin ULI, that is a lot easier sometimes than right, remembering to type fin Drush ULI and then um, any additional configuration that's necessary. As well as, uh, by default, we do not have phpMyAdmin. Many systems, um, many of the older systems do, so we found that the MAMPs and the WAMPs do. So we found that some people, and even some hosting companies, so cPanel um, and, and those items require, they don't require, but they have those items installed by default. So we said, what the heck, let's you know, set up a, an add-on for, uh, for phpMyAdmin so that people could interact with the database easier. So, yes. Uh, some people think of keep it simple, stupid, but I believe that people, uh, that we as developers, are really superheroes. Um, 
we make things work. And so we collectively are superheroes, and so we are the ones who make projects uh, spontaneous, and we are make them what we make them awesome. So, as that's a mouthful, uh, I want to navigate towards this ideal that we uh, at Doxel have. And the concept is uh, one and done. And one and done meaning that you are only running a single command, and in that command, um, within uh, a certain amount of time, so be it five, be it five minutes, be it 10 minutes, um, something shorter than what it was taking you previously, we have an environment up and running. Not only that, that is re reproducible to every person on the project. That is the constant theme we are, we are looking for. That one and done is usually ran by what we call a fin init. And so on most of our projects, we include an init script to say, hey, let's, uh, let's make sure these containers are up and running. Let's make sure that all the appropriate software is installed on the appropriate containers that we need, if we need extra software. Let's make sure all of our configuration is set up. Let's make sure we have a database that's pulled down. And, and the goal is that by the time we are, we've executed this and it's done and it's completed, we have a working environment. We don't have to do anything extra at that point because the automation has happened for us. Or some like to say automagic. And it is a command. Um, it is a command that as a developer you put together, um, you tell it what to do. You tell it to uh, go out to a specific environment, to a remote host. You tell it to go out to uh, oh, somewhere on your network and pull whatever necessary things it needs to do. And the concept is, it, it runs the following steps. It destroys whatever environment you have there. So usually, um, and that's similarly why that refresh script was created, because in it destroys and we want to start from scratch. So it destroys anything that's there. Uh, next, it initializes a new project. So you're starting as if you're starting from scratch. You're starting from the ground up. It installs all the appropriate items, so it runs your Composer install, it runs your um, app get install if you need it, uh, specific packages, it runs um, you know, whatever you need to install specifically for that project. And then it sets up. Um, so it runs out to the remote host, downloads the database, and then um, you know, does all the cache rebuilding or uh, re-indexes things for you as necessary. And so um, on top of that, one additional goal we always try to strive for is we always want to make production similar to our, or we actually want our development environment to be identical to our production environment. And the goal, the reason for that is it helps mitigate issues before they get up to production. There's nothing like trying to launch a project at the 11th hour and realizing that something's behind or something wasn't configured properly or some sort of caching isn't working properly and we're just not, we're just now finding about this and it's gonna take us a couple of hours to fix it. So that is the, uh, the biggest thing we strive for. Um, I know I as a developer strive for that and, and a lot of the people I work with on my team, we strive for that as well. So most of the projects we set up, um, as well as most of the people we talk to, we, we try to say, hey, Let's make sure we have the exact same versions of these applications. Let's make sure we have, um, you know, we're not running into any uh, road bumps uh, by the time we get to production so that the client's happy by the time it gets there. <sighs> All right. So now that I've rambled, um, I've realized I have enough time to do a basic demo. Um, so specifically, let's go. I will pull this over there, and I will. I will actually build that up even more. Uh, 
Although I'm realizing that as I'm blowing this up, it's really just increasing the size of the window. All right. So I'm going to show you the first. Uh, the biggest thing is I mentioned we have that fin command. The fin is what fin is what works. Um, it is the main command that runs Doxel specifically, and it is what uh, it is how we run a lot of our internal commands. All right, all that will. So, you know, as we run uh, fin, we could see you know, Doxel control, um, and then we have things like DB project system. Um, if you're on a Mac uh, and you're using uh, uh, boot to Docker, it's ran through a VM, so we, ha we have VM commands, um, as well as bash, exact, config, etc. So, just running fin alone will give you uh, a basic idea of what sort of commands are available. On top of that, you can run fin help, and most of our commands will have that. So, here we go. Uh, fin help. There we go. And we'll have extra uh, documentation on that. So specifically on the host command, these are the additional subcommands that can happen. Add, remove, list. And then we'll give you some examples of you know, how to use those. All right. So let's clear that. Uh, the biggest thing is I wanted to just show you kind of how easy it was to get a project started. Um, a new project. So uh, we're going to make a, uh, a test directory and we're going to do, uh, we're going to make Doxel and then I'm going to make a doc root because by default uh, we use the doc root folder within a project as that's where the doc root is. Those are customizable and configurable. Um, and there is information on that in our in our docs. So we'll go into our doc root. And so specifically, um, all right. So we are going to do. Uh, we have, uh, by default, Doxel comes with a, uh, a name server built into it, so it knows how to direct the .doxel domain. So all projects come with, uh, unless configured otherwise, are set to be the project name .doxel as the domain in which reach those. So just as a reference, I want to show you. Um, there we go. So... We don't have a project, so I did. Want, I wanted to show you that strictly because we haven't started a project, and and that way, if you go to a project that doesn't exist, that's what it looks like. Um, all right, so we have our test directory, we have our simple index file, and we run fin start. Now, fin, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of things are happening right now currently. Uh, we have a default configuration that happens in the background, and it sets up a database, it sets up a CLI, which is our PHP, and then it sets up a web server. Uh, as that is all happening, it, uh, it connects everything together, and then by the time everything is ready, we are now ready to go to our project. So if we come back over here and refresh, we have our PHP info. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is that, where is the version? We are using <coughs> 712. But on my machine, I'm actually using 716. So in the project, which is has that default configuration, it's set up to use PHP 7.1 and has a uh, uh, point 0.2, right? 7.1.2 set up at the moment as default. 
And then when you're in a project, right uh, on start, this will tell you what the status of all of those containers are in your project. And as you can see, we have our CLI, we have our database, we have our web, and then these are the ports specifically that they're accessible on. All right, so that is a basic, uh, that was a basic project. Now, um, to, we have a, as I mentioned, we have a, a list of different uh, items you can choose from. We have the Drupal 8, we have a Drupal 8 Composer version. Uh, seven WordPress, etc., and then we have a few other ones. We have Hugo and Gatsby, and then if you just wanted to build just a static HTML site. So because we are Drupal, I'm specifically going to go with uh, I'm going to go with the compiled version just because Composer take, can take a little bit longer to run. So we're going to say yes, we want to proceed, uh, but basically it's telling me where this is where this is going to be installed what specific project I chose, and then at the end of it, what's the URL going to be. So as that's running, um, this is set from a repository we have on GitHub, so you can always fork it and then create your own special needs for that. Oh wow, live demo All on the <laughs> internet. I'm, I always get nervous oh, yeah. about doing live demos just because I never know what's going to happen. I've had them work great, and when they do, then it's wonderful, but I've also had them fail. And at that point, I was like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so as this is downloading, all right. So we've cloned our repository. Maybe, yes. And I'm um, all right. Yeah. So, as you can see, when you do the when you start the project from scratch, it does a lot of the configuring for you. So the whole uh, installing site is the fin start piece that we ran manually before, and it runs through. Uh, the whole process. Uh, this will actually install dot, will install Drupal for you, and will tell you, you know, what it's what it's doing. So it will be very verbose for you. So you have you kind of know at that time what's going on. And so uh, as it's going to initialize the site, it's running uh, Drush site install and installing everything from scratch. Okay, there we go. So uh, installation complete, and then gives you username and password. So if we go to that now, we have a Drupal 8 site. And then just to quickly show you for admin. Everything, uh, everything is all set up. So we go to our reports, and now we have, we have, once again have PHP 7.1.20, as well as our memory limit and all the configuration for our site. Onboarding new developers. All right, let's see if I can quickly show you that. Um, so on our, uh, and this is actually public uh, example. This is actually a public repository, so it, w it is available. It comes with a Circle CI configuration for you as well. Um, but 
uh, in the project. The project is set up of a .doxel directory. And as we mentioned, our environment file uh, comes configured with what specific web image are we using, what database image. Um, if we're using a specific uh, version of, uh, of our of PHP, we can configure that there. Um, previously, I mentioned that a doc root, the doc root is set to um, doc root by default, and that's configurable by setting this variable. So these are all items that are shared amongst the team. Um, items you wouldn't share would obviously be uh, any sort of uh, tokens or keys for outside services. Uh, and those can go into actually a doxel-local environment file, and that way those won't be committed to the project. Uh, but we have commands, and those commands do uh, can do things from, uh, right now, Composure's built in, so this, this we could actually remove this one out, but we have gulp, which runs, uh, you know, goes to our site theme, which is in here, and runs gulp. Um, we have our init command, which goes through and uh, resets the environment, uh, and then starts up the environment again, uh, and then runs uh, in its, uh, an additional command called init site, which, we'll run that, runs, uh, we have that run in our CLI container, and specifically, do things like copy the default.settings.php file to just settings.php and fixing any directory permissions, um, running drush site install so that we have that we have that set up um, and by the time somebody's done. Uh, running composer install. So uh, having a project automatically run composer install for us so that way we don't have our developers aren't forced to necessarily do that, and it's just because it's part of the project steps, it's done automatically for them. And then, um, as I mentioned, we're running, uh, we're installing Gulp on the actual environment itself so that the developer doesn't have to install it. As well as other things, um, other configurations as well. So we're setting the local, um, the local language for the machine, as well as Josh configuration export, um, which can run from the container. And so the idea is that these commands and these configurations all live within a project, and that project can now be shared, and it's duplicatable, it's the same on every machine. And so I apologize if it sounds redundant, but that is, that's the whole point is that it's it can be used, it can be shared amongst the team members and nobody has to say, oh, well, it works on my machine. <sighs> All right. Now, I'm going to quickly mention this and then I think we have time for a few questions. Um, at the beginning, we talked about using Doxel for QA and delivery. Uh, that is what the Doxel Sandbox is brought kind of whole project concept is. Uh, to give you a brief understanding of how this would work, um, you know, with, with companies like Acquia and uh, Pantheon, they already kind of have something similar set up, um, but if you're not using either of them, what do you do? Um, and so previously, uh, you would have to set up chickens or you would have to set up some other uh, setup to get that to happen for you. But with Doxel specifically, this is what we're looking at. You have developers, you push to GitHub, uh, it works on a pull request, and then triggers Circle CI, uh, which does a lot of the automation for you, and then uh, whatever hosting company you decide to work with. So in this case, we use AWS, uh, and then it sets up uh, it clones and then sets up those environments for you on that remote. Uh, that purpose for that is now you can have feature development and clients can now see specific features and sign off on them ahead of time um, before you know, merging them in and possibly seeing any, any possible errors that happen. And then lastly, I do want to mention um, Lennon, Lennon, Mac over, 
uh, Makarov uh, is actually going to be at Bad Camp. He'll be giving a conversation on this. Um, this is a lot to read right now, so I will have the slides up, so don't worry about um, having to memorize all this. But he will be at Bad Camp giving a, con uh, a talk on the previous slide that we were just talking about, and that is the concept that if you don't post with one of the three top Drupal hosting companies, what do you do? What, you know, how do you get some of those features without um, without having to break down and go to them? So uh, that is Bad Camp, which is next month, the, the last week of October. Yes. All right. I apologize. I talked for a really long time. Um, does anybody have questions? Yes. So we gave the project create command give you the list of options. Yes. Do you need to add another option, like in, internally for just projects we create. Um, is that an add-on? That is currently not an add-on. Okay. We have uh, we are actually toying with the idea of using a repository, uh, so you can actually specify and create your own. So yes, mm -hmm. that is in the works of us uh, to possibly create something like that where you could you know, add a new project to that list. Okay. So. As of right now, no, um, but it is in the works. It'd be cool to be able to use not only the public repository, but also the internal one as well. Is mm -hmm. that something that? Yeah, you can use any repository. Okay. So uh, the goal is that we want to we want to make it work for you, um, and there are ways to configure. Uh, there are ways to configure the existing options, mm -hmm. but just not add on the add on to the list at the moment. Oh, okay. So if you wanted to replace, say, the Drupal 7 one with, an, <coughs> with your own public repository, uh, there's a way that you could configure that. We don't have that documented, but I know that the, we definitely do have a way to configure that. Okay. Cool. Yes? So you said the goal is to have your development environment in your production environment. Yep. So I'm assuming you have to be using Docker in your production environment you using the same images? Or? No. So the... In fact, not many people use right now Docker in production. The goal is to have the same versions of the applications you're using, the same versions of the buy um, any additional software you have installed. So, uh, same version of PHP, same version of Apache, same version of MySQL um, or uh, MariaDB. Um, you know, making sure you have those installed locally. Uh, same version of Solar set up and configured as well as the, the configuration works the same across both of them. So while you don't have to have your, uh, you don't have to have Docker in your production, the goal is that your development environment is going to mimic your production so you would have the same versions of those applications. And so on, uh, uh, Docker. It would help if I spelled correctly. Um, so PHP. So we'll do a base. Image out there that has a specific version of whatever. Yep. Application so. Have yeah. So specifically for like PHP, there's they have tons of images. Um, they have 7.3. They'll even have as low as uh, 5.6. I think there are some. Old, some people who are maintaining like 5.5 images, but the goal is to get, um, you know, if you're running 5.6.38 on, on your production, you end up using that. You know, you're not developing with PHP 7.1, and you're building for this, you're building for a 7.1 application when in actuality those functions or those classes don't work in 7.1, or they work in 7.1, they don't work in 5.6. So the, the idea is to have them both uh, mimic each other with versions and uh, applications that are being used. What updates come out of production code and for production code and images that you want Yes. So you would have your production mimic the Docker images. All right. Um, I think we are, yes, we are at time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and 